Hi there everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm the GCSE science teacher. In today's video, we're gonna learn all about chemical analysis and different chemical tests that you need to know for your GCSE exam. If you do find this video helpful and you enjoy it, let me know by giving it a big thumbs up, share it with someone else, and please do subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you so much to everyone who has subscribed. It's such a lovely community of, of you guys here. So thank you so, so much. Let's get started and talk about pure and impure substances first of all. So what does that actually mean? A pure Pure substance in chemistry means a substance that is only made of one type of thing, so single elements or a compound, and it is therefore not a mixture. And we can determine this based on graphical data. We've got some examples here. And if there is a substance that is pure, it will have a sharp melting point, but a mixture of substances will actually melt over a range of temperatures. And that's because there's different components to it that all have their own individual melting point or boiling point, depending on what you're talking about. So so in the exam, if you see a graph like this, you want to identify that a nice straight horizontal line tells you there's only one thing in that substance that has that temperature or that melting point, that boiling point, and therefore it must only be made of one type of substance and therefore it is pure. So one of the first practicals that you may have come across in this topic is gas tests. And you need to know of the four specific gases and their tests and what you'd identify or observe if you were to do this in a lab. So what I recommend for this particular topic is to make lots of flashcards on each of the tests so you can easily remember what bits you need to know for the exam. So let's talk about the first gas. We have hydrogen gas. Now this one uses a burning splint over a test tube that contains that gas. Now you'd probably do an experiment that would release a gas and collect it into a test tube. And what you want to do is place the burning splint into the test tube and you should hear a nice squeaky pop sound. Now this is just a bit of health and safety. If you are doing experiments and you are testing for gases, it's always important if you're not sure what the gas is, by the way, you use a fume cupboard. It's super important, especially if you're not sure, um, because there is some gases we're going to talk about that are quite toxic. So hydrogen's fine, but it's flammable. So you've got to be very, very careful. Um, oxygen, okay? So we're going to use a glowing splint this time, and we're going to insert it into the test tube that contains the gas. Now, if there is oxygen there, it should relight that splint. So so you should have a nice, easy, observable test there. The next gas is carbon dioxide, CO2. And what you're going to do is use aqueous solution of calcium hydroxide, otherwise known as lime water. And when you bubble carbon dioxide through it, you should see that lime water that was originally transparent. It should actually turn cloudy. Um, and then the last one is chlorine. So this is a very toxic gas. Again, you'd want to use a fume cupboard for this. You don't want to breathe in the vapors, but you would use litmus paper that's slightly dampened and it would actually bleach that litmus paper if chlorine gas is present. So let's talk about metal hydroxides, the next type of chemical test. Now, if you think of metals, remember they always form positively charged ions or cations because they are able to donate or lose an electron. Hydroxides, however, remember if you see this word, you want to instantly think of OH minus ions. So they are negatively charged, which is why we form those metal hydroxides because they chemically bond together by essentially working as ionic compounds. Um, if you haven't seen my ionic bonding video, I'll link that for you. But what you need to know for this particular test, when you have sodium hydroxide solution, you can use it to identify some metal ions. So for example, we have a solution of aluminium ion, calcium ions, and magnesium ions, and they all form white precipitates when sodium hydroxide is added. So you'll see this kind of white powdery substance forming in a liquid or in a solution. The only difference is when you have aluminium ions mixing with sodium hydroxide, it will fully dissolve in excess sodium hydroxide. And that's a way to distinguish between aluminium, calcium and magnesium ions. Now, if we have solutions of copper 2 or iron 2 or iron 3 ions, OK, and the two and the three, that just indicates the charge that it has. So copper two is a Cu2 plus or iron two is Fe2 plus. Um, the iron three ions are iron ions. I know iron ions, but 
iron three ions or Fe three plus. That's what those numbers mean. Um, you can identify them because they all form colored precipitates when sodium hydroxide is solution is added. So if we look at copper ions, copper two ions specifically, it will form a blue precipitate. Iron two ions will form a green precipitate. It's very difficult to say iron ions. Iron three ions will form a brownish red precipitate. Um, let me know in the comments if you also struggle with saying iron ions. I just honestly, but you know what I'm trying to say. They form colored precipitates and you should know the colors. Um, you should also know, by the way, the formula and the equations for these. So I've linked those at the bottom there and you can see them here. Okay, so we have halide ions. How do we test for this? Well, a halide ion is any element that essentially has been found in the halogen group. So the halogens are in group seven. Um, so we've got chlorine, fluorine, iodine, bromine, all of those wonderful elements. They are non-metals, so they form gases, and they also can form ions by a accepting a specific electron. Um, they only really accept one electron because they're in group seven. They want a full outer shell, so they can only take on one to have a total of eight in their valence electrons, okay? Remember electron configuration, we start off with two in the first shell, eight in the second, eight with these obviously as well. So what do you need to know? Well, in terms of the halide ions, you need to know that a solution produced um, precipitates in silver nitrate solution. So they will form specific colored precipitates when you add silver nitrate to them. And you need to also know that this is only in the presence of dilute nitric acid. So you need some acidity there. Now, the different colors are as follows. Silver chloride is a white precipitate, silver bromide is a cream colour, and silver iodide will form a yellowy precipitate. So there is another type of anion that you should be aware of in terms of chemical tests. So we've talked about the halide ions, the halogens that are able to form negatively charged ions, but you also need to know about the sulfate ions, which have a negative charge as well. But unlike the halogens, the, and the ions that they form, the sulfate ions actually have a two minus charge. And that's because they have accepted two electrons um, and given it that overall charge. So how do we test for sulfate ions? Well, what you do is you would have a solution of sulfate ions and you would add barium chloride solution in the presence of hydrochloric acid. And this would form a white precipitate. And if you wanted to see the equation for this and you wanted to see what it actually looked like in terms of the formulas and things, you'd see that barium has a two plus charge because it's a metal and it reacts with sulfate ions and those charges will cancel out because it now forms that compound. So hopefully that will help you there. Now, <laughs> some of you will probably be sat there thinking, so some of these will form white colors, some of them will form cream colors, some of them will form yellow colors. This is not very easy to distinguish. Um, and you're right. So scientists have come up with instrumental methods that are less subjective in terms of color changes that we can use to observe different compounds and elements. And one that you really need to know about is the flame emission spectroscopy. And essentially what this does is it uses the data, uses a small amount of it to produce some data data and we can determine that data from reference data and compare the two to identify um, unknown substances. So let's talk about how it works. So essentially the sample is put through a flame and the light given out is passed through a spectroscope and this is kind of like a very small piece of equipment. The output is a line spectrum which you can see here and it can be analyzed like I said to measure the concentrations and the ions in the solution and each specific element will have its own unique emission spectrum so that makes it really easy to identify which element is found in there. Um, metal present in the sample is identified like I said using comparable data sets. And that's something that you should be able to, to say or use. And the advantages of this type of method, like I said, is that it's much more accurate than just subjective. Oh, I think it's yellow, or I think it's cream, or I think it's white. Um, it's much more sensitive as well. So if the, you only have a very small sample, you can actually pick up quite a lot of information from it. And it's incredibly rapid. So you just place the sample in and you'll get your results very quickly. So it's very beneficial and often used as well. 
And that's it from me today. I've been the GCSE science teacher and you have been curious. If you did enjoy this video, let me know by subscribing. Join this amazing community we have on YouTube. Thank you so, so much for all of your support. I do appreciate it. If you'd like more videos, I have them linked for you. I also have linked the flame tests video that I did, which links nicely to this topic too. So if you are still wanting more information about different tests that you need to know for GCSE, I'll link that one for you. Um, in the meantime, have a great day and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.